everybody. I'm Dave Rice. I'm going to present about deck control, um, the process of trying to make video playback machines do what we want and what we can learn from communicating with them. So I've given a lot of presentations about digitization before, and normally I focus on, um, like when I'm setting up a digitization station, I, I get the back of the deck and I try to find the highest quality video and audio output I can get and I connect it into like a video capture card and record it into a computer. Um, with a deck like this, I would generally take the SDI signal out. Um, the SDI signal would contain video, audio, uh, captions, data, time code, uh, and you know, I would ret record that into a computer and feel good about my work as a body visual preservationist. Um, so Often, like when you want to attach a deck to a computer, like eventually when you're building up the system, you start to have more decks and more computers. So um, at where I work at the City University of New York, we, we generally have like a set of like four different Mac minis that could connect to uh, potentially a dozen different decks because sometimes it's VHS day and sometimes it's UMatic day. Um, so we have like a patch bay where we connect like the, the deck we want to a computer. Um, so rather than just have an SDI connection from the deck to the computer directly, it'll go to a router and then from the router to a computer. And from the router, we can kind of route the, the signal from, from a particular deck computer combination. So once I have the tape in, I get on the computer and then I do this kind of move uh, where I lean across the room and I hit play on the video machine and I hit record on the software to record the file. Uh, I don't necessarily have to do these at the same time, but if I hit record too early, I'll be, you know, adding some content that's not necessarily part of the original source, like some extra uh, black frames at the beginning. And if I hit record too late, then I'll miss part of the recording. So uh, coordinating this uh, hitting play on one deck and record on the other uh, on the software is, is a significant exercise. Um, so some people to get around this, they'll use uh, these kinds of cables, like these nine pin cables that you can connect to a, com that you can connect to a video machine to send commands to it, like to, to play or um, stop, rewind, eject. Uh, this is kind of like a very free remote control interface for working with a video machine. Um, so, there, so some software used to interact with this directly, like with uh, Final Cut Pro 7's login capture interface, if you had a capture card that supported these nine pin cables, you could connect your software to the deck. And if I hit like the play button or the rewind button in my software, it would uh, transfer the controls over to the deck. Uh, in, in modern audiovisual editing applications, they tend not to maintain this type of feature. Uh, so even though Final Cut 7 could interface and control a video machine directly, uh, Final Cut X can't. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember if Adobe Premiere currently supports deck control or not. So one of the reasons, like I wouldn't, one of the reasons I didn't necessarily like use any deck control and instead was doing this move, was that if I have, if I want a router to um, customize what deck to computer combination I have, um, that's going to involve a bunch of like SDI cables to transfer the video and the audio. If I then also have to manage a routing of like nine pin deck control cables, it kind of just like doubles the mass of cables. Um, so in addition to routing audio and video, I have to like synchronize a routing of um, like nine pin data pin connections so that I, I'm not necessarily like telling one deck to play while recording data from a different unrelated deck. <coughs> So if I'm just using um, audiovisual cables and not deck control, the workflow ends up kind of looking like this, where it's just a, a linear process where the deck has the frames, it sends them over an audiovisual cable, and the computer just tries to keep up as best it can by recording them to a file. Um, the computer just ends up kind of passively re receiving the, the frames. Um, it might get laggy, it might not be able to keep up with the data rate, so we'd have drop frames. and like in this kind of case, the computer can't ask the deck to stop or slow down. If it's having trouble keeping up, it just has to either f fail at the recording or, uh, or just struggle uh, like we all do. Um, so I started working on this project called DB Rescue uh, recently, which is all about making uh, software to capture data off DB tapes in particular. 
And d DV tapes often have errors that look like this. This is an example of my friend Ben. I was recording a video of him at Dunkin' Donuts. And oh, thank you, I got power. So my computer doesn't die, that's good. <laughs> um, and this is an example of a head clog. Like when part of the, the reader of the tape is, is clogged, it'll just repeat data from a prior frame as a way to conceal an error. So often when DV tape glitches, you can have this kind of pattern where part of the frame gets stuck even though the rest of the frame is, is moving. Um, so when I got further into this project, I realized that when I play the tape another time, the errors might happen at about the same rate, but they happen in different places. So I'm gonna play this clip, which is a, um, a clip of the same tape being digitized six times. And you'll see the sort of glitchiness kind of moves around from one to the other. I mean, it's a bit hard to catch in real time playback, but you'll, you'll see these little errors like popping up on one or the other. So with the DV codec, it has this uh, particular feature that's specific to DV where inside the codec, it'll make a note of which parts of the frame are read correctly from the tape and which ones aren't. So I made this other copy of the same recording where the parts that are read incorrectly from tape are replaced with yellow. So it's a bit easier to see where the errors are here because I'm just like disabling what the deck is doing for video error concealment. Um, so you can see in all six of these recordings, the errors happen at, at roughly the same rate, but they're just in different places because the dust bunny rolled over or the, you know, there's still the same amount of contaminants in the deck, but they just get jumbled around because I'm fast forwarding and rewinding to do these additional captures. Uh, so if I'm trying to preserve this tape, I might say I want to pick one of them to be the master or uh, I could potentially do an extremely laborious edit to combine them together. Uh, but in the DV Rescue project, we worked on this feature called Merge. Um, so in DV Rescue, um, Jerome made this method so that we can take multiple inputs and send them into DV Rescue. They would all be analyzed individually um, and merged together to make like a better copy uh, from a bunch of bad copies. So like if frame one is perfect, it's just kind of written to the output as is. If it has an error, uh, then that corresponding location is checked in the next copy to see if it's an error there. And if it isn't, then we just take the better copy from the other one. Um, <clears throat> so I've been, I've been excited about this feature because it's really cool. <clears throat> um, this is kind of the resulting summary you get at the end uh, where DV Rescue will say what it used to sort of reconstruct what would be possible if you're using the best of every copy. Uh, so there's like a list here that shows the six input input files uh, and they all have, um, this recording is only about um, 1,322 frames. Uh, and in each recording, the error rate goes from about 6% of the frames have errors to about 11% of the frames have errors, just because this is um, like a kind of scratchy, dirty part of the tape. Once they're all kind of combined together, the rate goes down to just a single frame having errors. Um, so I wanted to pull up that frame to see what it was, and it's, it's this one. Each, each one of these copies is misread from the tape. The tape probably has like some physical damage on it. Uh, so regardless of trying to read it six times, I'm, I'm still failing to get a perfect copy. This is what it looks like if I take the blocks that are misread and um, replace the concealed vi video with just like yellow. So you can see that there's sort of, a, uh, maybe the lower right one has less errors than the others, uh, but they all still have errors. When these six frames are run through the DV merge process, it ends up making a result that looks like this, which looks quite a bit better than any of the individual copies. And when I tr try to uh, cover the concealed video of yellow, you can, you can kind of see the same. So in the combined copy, it still has a few blocks that are, are errors, but it w this is kind of assembled from taking the best of the six individual frames and um, you know, taking the best valid blocks from each one. The, the, you know, this is just a trait that's feasible in the design of DV. So I did six captures of the tape, which took six times the tape duration in order to do that test. Um, so then we were thinking, well, what if we have the computer analyze the DV as it's coming in, and if there's a problem, stop the deck and retry it. So we're just retrying the part that has a known error rather than reading all of the tape even though only a small percentage of the frames have errors. 
Um, so this is this just shows uh, the command line running in process, reading all the frames with the front of a deck. When it finds the error, it reports on it. It backs up the the tape and rereads it, merges the results together, and then continues. Um, so this is um, quite a bit of a change from sorry, it flipped back so quickly from this this slide. Um, because often in digitization work, the computer's not doing anything but receiving and writing what it's getting. And we're starting to use a workflow in DB Rescue where the computer, instead of just being a passive recipient of the frame, is kind of controlling the deck and what it sends and asking it to send things again if there's a problem. Uh, this, this is used in a couple other for formats like uh, sector DVDs and hard drives. Like if the computer's reading and it sees that there's like a uh, a checksum fail, like it'll it'll reread part of it. So like if you use um, a DVD preservation tool like DVD Disaster, uh, you'll see it in its log. It'll say like when it's rereading sectors um, multiple times, trying to get a, a, a successful reading, even though a lot you know DVDs get super scratched up and they can be hard to get a perfect first pass. Uh, oh, this is like one test, like uh, Jerome, uh, this is me cutting out of a chat Jerome sent me. He was trying to see uh, is like, is there an end to rereading a tape? So he did a test where I had this this tape in my room where I like just, I crinkled it up so I'd have a known error in a particular place because uh, he was like remoting into my bedroom computer and trying to read some DV tapes that way for testing the software. And he set the tape, the program to reread the tape up to 20 times to see if it could remove all the errors. And even on the 20th pass, it was still finding um, blocks that came through correctly on the 20th pass, but not passes one through 19. Um, this is from a particularly like mangled tape that I made. Um, so, but normally this data is kind of cleaned up after you know one or two additional passes. So with, this is the, the cabling that's used to connect a DV device to a computer. It's just a, a firewire cable. And this transmits both deck control and all the audiovisual data. So it has the, the DV stream, the, the audiovisual data, timecode captions, and that metadata on if the read was um, accurate or if it includes concealment. <clears throat> so that's heading from the deck into the computer, but also deck control commands over the same cable can go from the computer back to the deck. So there's this kind of like two-way communication between the computer and the deck. So um, the workflow kind of ends up looking like this, where the video, the tape player is like, okay, here's some frames, and the deck is like, okay, these frames, like, they suck, can you please, like, resend them? And, you know, can send the rewind command to the deck to back up, reread, try again. Um, you know, so it ends up being this sort of uh, back and forth communication between the machine to reread the tape as many times as the software would, would like to in order to assemble um, a more accurate transfer. So we wanted to think about how do I, how can I do this with not DV tapes? With DV, it makes it pretty easy because one, DV gives you the information to know yes or no if the frame is accurate. And if the frame has um, inaccurate data in it, it tells you exactly where it is. So you can you can know, okay, I will look in this exact corresponding place in a matching frame I've never captured to see if it's accurate there. Uh, and also FireWire has the deck controls inside. With um, SDI, that's often used for like DigiBeta tape, ASP, like other uh, types of broadcast video tape formats. There's not any um, error data to say if the frame is correct or not. You end up having to use something like a, a QC tool style approach to like analyze and guess if there's a problem there because the, the color is strange or there's a lot more noise in the frame. So uh, with non-DV, you, you have to find a different way to find out if you have a head plug or a misread. And also these um, SDI, which transmits over these BNC cables, doesn't have a way to communicate deck control through it. Uh, so we end up having to go to these kinds of nine pin cables to do it. Uh, but one, one challenge here is if we want a computer to be receiving like content over SDI and ask the deck to resend those frames if they're bad, we have to get the computer to be able to tell the deck we want you to stop, rewind, and then play from there. And I was trying to look around and find a like cheap, accessible option for connecting these nine pin cables into a computer, and I couldn't find anything that was terribly affordable. Um, so we ended up making, developing a cable to do it. Um, this is part of the Digital Video Commander project hosted by Mepops, and 
I can show you what it looks like. It's uh, we got we got like this this cable that has nine wires in it, and then this is like a terminal box that opens up, and you can splice the wires inside. Like inside, it just kind of looks like the picture in the slide, where I just get a little screwdriver, I plug in my nine wires, and I do this on both sides, and it's set. And then on the other side of the cable is this adapter that goes USB to uh, the the nine pin cable. So when I connect these two together, like this is maybe like twenty dollars worth of cable. Like I can get a, like a modern uh, iMac or Windows computer to be able to control like a Umatic deck. Um, so it's, I don't know, I always think of this being like several decades of technology being translated from like the most modern computer we have to these, you know, 40 year old uh, video machines we're, we're attempting to control. Um, but in order to make the cable, we had to map the wires from the computer end to the, the video deck end, or the Inni and Audi as, as we were calling it. This is just like another diagram that's kind of showing the pieces of how we built it. Um, like at one point in the in the digital video commander project, we had a big table set up and we made maybe two dozens of these cables just like sitting around having kind of a craft project of cutting wires and 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 splicing and getting them all together. And we sent out uh, care packages to uh, some archivists with uh, candy inside and the cables and some instructions. So in addition to having an SDI cable to connect from the, the deck to the computer, uh, we have this chain of um, cables that brings the deck control to the computer as well. So then in order to get the software to have the computer send these requests to the deck, uh, we ended up working with uh, Heideke who wrote this, um, he originally wrote a Sony 9-pin um, piece of software for Arduino where he was using um, like those newer black magic recorders where you put like a solid state card in and he wanted a computer just to send a command over to say like, okay, hit the record right now or uh, you know, hit record and stop. So uh, he, I ended up asking him, can you, can you do this but remove the Arduino dependency? And like that's when we were able to get like this, this software update with this cable set that worked correctly. So currently if you run the Sony 9-pin command line tool um, that's downloadable at uh, the media area site, you just get these basic like fast forward rewind play options, um, but also, five minutes, cool. Um, but you also get options to ask for the status and the time code. Uh, so once I was able to see like the raw status data you'd get back from the deck, it was pretty interesting. This is an example of the kind of binary data you get. Um, you're able to tell if the deck is in local or remote mode. Basically, is it controllable by you or not? Is, is the cassette in or out of the machine? And then it'll tell you if, if it's in stop mode or if it's rewinding, fast forwarding. It'll just kind of tell you what directions it's doing. Also in byte eight, it tells you if it's near the end of the tape. Because like when you get to the end of the tape, you get to that like clear piece of plastic and there's a light that shines through to a sensor. And if that sensor is activated, it will activate the end of tape warning here. So this is gonna be a bit difficult to see, but I then started to try to capture tapes while repacking them and capturing the data. So uh, I'm getting like all the binary flags across and you'll see at one point, like I think the, this and this uh, one are representing that it's in fast forward mode. Eventually you'll see it like kind of shift over because the deck eventually gets to the end of the tape. Yeah, right here, it will have the end of tape marker and then it flips into rewind. And now the tape's going backwards and eventually it hits like the time code range again and gets all the way back to the end of the tape, says it's at the end of the tape at the other end, and then stops. Uh, so I was very curious of like what I could learn about a tape by just uh, spamming it with status commands while it's in a rewind and fast forward. Um, and I was doing that while, ca while capturing it in rewind and fast forward. So um, these are some images I took of the tapes where I'm just taking the single central column of pixels from each frame while it's in fast forward mode so from left to right represents a, a timeline of the process of fast forwarding a tape to one end and then it uh, bouncing back into rewind and going back to the beginning. So the sort of like green blue stripe you see on the left and right ends are the color bars at the end of the tape and the middle is um, the, the end of the tape. So I guess the left and right are the beginnings of the tape, the middle represents the, the end. 
Um, this is a DigiBeta and a Betacam SX tape being uh, repacked. So fast forwarding all the way and rewinding all the way while capturing all the time coded data. Uh, when I did a beta SP uh, tape, I also got the audio. The audio sounds kind of crazy because it's in that like high speed, like chipmunk style. But I was very curious about this because with a tape like this, I can see that there are two active audio channels, not four. And I can get that knowledge for the entire tape just by like digitizing it while it's under high speed shuttle. So I, I sort of realized that there's two important scenarios for including deck control in a process. One is uh, during digitization that it's feasible to ca capture audiovisual data into a buffer with time code to identify the frames, analyze them for likely errors, and if there's likely errors, you could potentially have the computer rewind the tape, get a second copy, analyze to see which copy is the best, output that, and, and keep going. So with uh, deck control being involved in the process, you can have this kind of like double take uh, process to digitization. Uh, the other scenario I saw deck control being useful is before digitization in doing this like repack where you're capturing a tape while it's just rewinding, and, well fast forwarding and rewinding. That's often a technique before digitization because you want to like apply an even tension to the tape before you digitize it. Because some of these tapes might have just been sitting on a shelf for decades before being digitized. Uh, but also by just spamming it for status requests during the process, you can get information about the time code ranges on the tape. So you can say, okay, it's a one hour tape, but there's only like a 10 minute recording on it. Or like a 10 minute recording and then a time code break and then I see like an underlying recording. Um, and with some formats you get some clues about the presence of like audio channels, closed captioning, that you can just like scrub out of like that high speed capture um, from repacking. All right, so that's where I'm at in this research now, but I'm kind of excited to continue, so thanks. I think the excitement is shared and felt throughout the room. Um, having th said that, do we have questions? Yep. Yeah. Please state your name and your, and your question. Yeah, David Flugel. Um, do you see the high-speed captures as an element also worthwhile to put into the archival package? <laughs> Maybe. Um, I mean, I think often I'm like repacking the tape anyway, and if I just had some software control the repacking of the process, it might as well digitize from it too, because like by just asking the software, like this theoretical software, to repack the tape, when it's done, it could say, okay, here's how much duration of content you have, here's like, uh, okay, this is only eight bits because it's from an SX tape and it has this many audio channels. So I think that it gives you a lot of information to have before you digitize. Because sometimes I just feel lost, like I don't know if I should capture two channels of audio or four. Like I would like to know if this tape has captions and it doesn't look like it at the beginning, but maybe it happens later. Um, but I think like once you have the full digitization, it would supersede this, this little uh, quick copy. So I'm not sure if, um, I mean I found this data really useful before before getting ready to digitize the full tape, but I'm not sure if that utility would continue after I actually have the full content of the tape, so. Okay, um, I'm gonna cut you short. We have a second question here, and that's the last question, because then we have to cool. shuttle on to the next one. Hi, uh, Randy Cicchini. Um You mentioned various different formats. Can you talk about what formats this works with and what it does not? I, well, I mean, I was talking about DB tape in particular in the DB Rescue project for part of it, and that's where I sort of learned and put into practice this technique to have a computer reread, like control the deck to reread parts, and then I was trying to apply it to other types of tape. So I did a test with Beta SX, DigiBeta, and Beta SP, uh, and I see I get tons of time code information and like the flags from the deck, but whether I get like any high speed audio information seems dependent on the format of, and the deck. Um, so I don't know, I'm just at like the sort of exciting part where I'm like, oh, this sort of research is worthwhile and I should continue. Amazing, thank you so much, Dave. <clears throat>